Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. This is our um, webinar on keeping your employees physically safe and free from scams during COVID-19. This COVID-19 uh, pandemic is really wrecking havoc on a lot of our organizations. And so we're trying to give you some information that will be very helpful there. Um, this webinar is hosted by the National Safety Council, the Nebraska Chapter, and the Better Business Bureau. And we're very thankful for the partnership um, with the Better Business Bureau and uh, two nonprofit organizations working together for our community. So we're very excited about that. I'm Susan Booth with the National Safety Council, and I'll be your host today. We have two speakers today that are going to give us some great information and resources that will be helpful um, to protect your employees and your organization. Before I get started, I just have a couple of quick announcements. One, if you have any questions, um, we're going to have the presenters go ahead and do their presentations and then we'll do some Q&A after that. So if you have any questions, just send them to me on your chat and we'll do Q&A at the end of each one of the sessions. This session is being recorded. Um, so we'll have it, uh, the link on the Safety Council website and on the Better Business website, Better Business Bureau website, and it will be on all of our social media channels so that you can access it if you want to go back and listen to it. Um, I just want to uh, tell you a little bit about an event that the Safety Council is putting on. It will be on November 3rd. It is our 37th annual Safety and Health Summit. Um, this year, of course, it's going to be a virtual event. We have some great speakers, uh, lots of speakers on safety initiatives, uh, great keynotes, so we invite you to register for that. You can also get CEUs, um, and you can register for that at safenebraska.org 2027. Uh, last but not least, as I was looking at the list of attendees, I saw a lot of HR people on our registration list today. Something that the Safety Council has found over the last couple of years is we've noticed there's been an increase in HR professionals having dual roles and also managing safety. So we launched a couple of years ago a certificate program called Safety for the Human Resource Professionals. Um, that is coming up December 14th and 15th. If you're interested in more information about that, you can contact me or go to our website, safenebraska.org. Um, you also, for the safety profession, or for the HR professionals, you can get HRCI um, CEUs too. So something that you might be really interested in doing. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Terry Anderson. Terry is going to talk about um, the return to work updates and other COVID-19 resources for the safe for being safe in your organization. Terry's one of our workplace safety consultants. He's a certified safety professional with vast experience in emergency response, having worked in um, the natural gas um, distribution company for many, many years. His experience, safety experience, spans manufacturing, warehousing, and construction. He's also very, very passionate about workplace ergonomics and best practices in taking care of your employees' safety and health. So we're very, very thankful to have Terry's safety knowledge and his passion as part of our team. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Terry, and I will, um, when you get done, I'll do the Q&A with you. And uh, again, anybody, if you have any questions, feel free to just send those to me via chat and we'll take care of those at the end of Terry's presentation. So, Terry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Uh, yes, okay. It looks pretty good, I think. Susan, he, Jeff, you can see it okay? All righty. Um, good morning. Uh, Terry Anderson, safety professional, um, coming up on three decades almost, but enough about that. Um, I want to just kind of go take us back in time a little bit. Late April, early May, I held uh, two back-to-back -back sessions, and what we looked at that time is going to see some similarities with what we look at today, but a lot of new information and a lot of new things to, to watch for. Back in April and May, we had health mandates from the state of Nebraska. Douglas County was very active and also Lancaster County. We've seen some shift there because now Douglas County has taken a step back 
And we've also seen the state of Nebraska, for instance, regarding um, mandatory mask use, they've actually said that it's uh, state law prohibits them or limits them from trying to uh, incorporate any kind of a mask mandate statewide. So there's been a little bit of a shift and you've seen um, more recently, if you're from the areas, if you have operations in Omaha or Lincoln, you see the mask mandates for those localities. Uh, we also looked at that time CDC guidelines, OSHA guidelines, and that's just what they are. They're guidelines, uh, but they are really strong indicators of what we should be looking to, to follow suit. And then lastly, uh, we looked at a COVID response plan template. Um, it actually comes out of the state of Minnesota. Uh, the government officials there did a really nice job preparing workplaces that for one reason or another, if uh, an employer decided to build a response plan, uh, this template's a great starting point. I'll show you later on in the presentation how to uh, go back and grab that if you're interested. And of course, at the time we talked about the emerging uh, talk about potentially having face coverings or people doing temperature checks and face coverings is still kind of one of the hot topics that we'll come back to. What I'd really like to do is you know, I find this, and by the way, this presentation will be available. And so some of these links here, um, you can get a live link version uh, and this is a great presentation that I, I, I take just a few seconds because you had some doubters and I know we still have some doubters out there. And as soon as this comes up, I'm going to have to pause it. I'm going to bring it back to January 1. And January 1 of this year, this is what a day-to-day -day death rate looked like worldwide for various ailments and other uh, uh, events that could uh, come, come uh, impact people. Somewhere in the middle, you see a pink one, it's influenza, 566 people per day. And at that time we had COVID at zero at the very bottom of the chart. I'm just gonna play this out because what you're gonna see as the year, as days tick by, you'll, you'll see where some of those doubters who said, hey, COVID is not killing as nearly as many people as influenza and so on, but we see the change. And so I'm gonna play this out real quickly. This takes it out to uh, mid-August. We'll see some of the changes. At the bottom, um, the COVID line is just now starting to be seen as kind of a pale green. And while everything else will kind of stay in position as they gain their numbers per day, we'll see how the COVID uh, begins to really leapfrog. Hey, Terry. Yes. I don't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Um, you've been made host on that. Um, and I'm, I'm being told that there are people that are sitting outside of the room trying to get in. I believe that you need to accept them. Oh, okay. My apologies. I'm, I'm getting texts from people. Sorry to, to uh, interrupt you. That's fine. Okay, I think we've got them in. All right, I'll, I'll continue playing. Welcome for those that were joining here just a moment ago. Um, this is a uh, chart just showing the progression of COVID. I'll bring it back down, play it real quick again. And it shows the, the leapfrogging that the uh, COVID death rate uh, has over other uh, ailments. Um, right there, we saw it pass influenza. And again, this is all real numbers and uh, excellent, excellent results from uh, this organization that uh, kind of really puts it all in perspective. Now in the span of about six months, it became uh, something that was, you know, again, kind of what is this to, to something that has certainly uh, taken the lead in terms of uh, health issues. All right, I'll minimize that, but if anybody's ever interested in that, that's, that'll be available. Uh, the link there will work, um, but you could get that if you go back and grab this presentation. But locally, let's ask ourselves, Nebraska, Iowa, are COVID cases dropping or rising? Uh, there's a number of studies have been done, and uh, this one was reported by Yahoo uh, August 31st. It's based on a University of Washington study. It's saying that Iowa will not peak until about November 4th and Nebraska would peak around November 12th. 
Also, this is a great study to have a look at. Um, the interesting thing, if you see on this chart below, you see a red line is arcing up to the right, a dotted line, and you see a green line kind of hanging low. Um, that's the difference between if we continue with mass or we don't. And if we go away from the mass, they're, they're suggesting that that peak that they suggest is coming is going to be much, much worse than if we continue with uh, mask use. And there's a number of good details from there. Again, if you come back and access this uh, presentation, you can get those links working for you. So what do we have legally? What do we have to follow here in Nebraska? We have the Nebraska Directed Health Measure. It's illegally enforceable. It's through the Nebraska Department of Human and Health Services. We typically don't see their face. We, we would see Governor uh, Ricketts on TV speaking on their behalf. Occasionally, members of that organization come in. But typically, the face of Nebraska has been Governor Ricketts. Um, we have uh, been and, and will be until September 13th, which is Sunday, uh, in a reopening phase three, limits our gatherings uh, to no more than 50% indoor, 75% outdoor capacity. And here in Nebraska, the state defines greater than 10 patrons or guests or an invitees. What I wanna point out is that Lincoln and Lancaster County define this differently. It's more restrictive and as a result, we have to remember, you've always got to follow the most restrictive. And so here's what it says for Nebraska. We'll also see that coming up as of Monday, it'll change. And Nebraska is going to move to phase four, where gatherings are limited to 75% indoor, 100% outdoor. Unless you're Lincoln, Lancaster County, you're going to have more restrictive than that. Uh, the Nebraska Directed Health Measure, other things, and I'll go through this very quickly, is that, again, Gatherings at restaurants and weddings, et cetera. Parties of eight or less must be separated by six feet. That's part of the Nebraska um, directed health measure. I'll point out what it says at the bottom is other than that, uh, examples of like hair salons, the Nebraska directed health measure has very few requirements around six foot distancing and face mask use. Uh, very, very limited. We see the one there at the top about restaurants and weddings. Um, because notice it goes on to say the limitations on gatherings don't apply to healthcare facilities, offices, factories, retail stores, polling places, places of worship. So they don't have the six foot distancing. They don't have the mask requirement. Where we come back to that is the Omaha, Lincoln, Lancaster areas. Travel quarantine. Some of you may have caught that. You may have business travelers uh, who are hopping on a plane. And what, are the, what questions have come about there? The CDC recently dro dropped its recommendations of self-quarantining after being involved in international travel. But what they're saying is you need to follow what your point of origin or your final destination dictates. What does Nebraska say? They say any person coming from any foreign point of origin and entering Nebraska is a final destination so not transferring flights at, out of Epley, but actually coming to Nebraska as a destination, then they must self-quarantine for 14 days. And some of you may have also heard of uh, places like Chicago and other states. They have a, I'll call it international travel-related quarantine. Um, this is an article from CNN that's very well done. Some of the links are being updated still today. But if you want to go find information that you know is absolutely up to date, you can find it in these state-by-state -state links by the CDC. Let me take you real quick here. Got another late arrival, I have to admit. I'm just going to take you down real quick. To, let's look at Connecticut. And what does Connecticut say? Any traveler coming from a state that has a positive rate of 10 or more, uh, or 10% uh, higher positivity uh, rate, must self-quarantine for 14 days. Nebraska and Iowa are greater than 10%, just by a little bit, but that means you travel to Connecticut, you're gonna to have to self-quarantine. And again, I'll take us down here to Illinois, and it mentions Illinois, no statewide restrictions, but a 14-day quarantine for visitors, and there we see Nebraska and Iowa are contained in that list. And it does, notice it says they update that list every Tuesday, you can use this from CNN to check for updates, but also, as I pointed out on the same uh, page, there's a state-by-state -state link supplied by the CDC. So if you've got travelers, you wanna watch out about that quarantine requirement. Previously, Douglas County had an, they called it an amended order. 
that is no longer. In fact, right now, if you go to the Douglas County website, which is a really pretty good website, uh, it mirrors a little bit what we see that Lancaster County is doing. They simply refer you on to the Nebraska Directed Health Measure and the City of Omaha Face Mask Mandate. So in the past, uh, Douglas County had a lot of say so and push lately uh, or around the, uh, the region. Um, they've backed away. They've left it to the Nebraska Directed Health Measure and the City of Omaha, and of course, uh, to our west a little bit, Lincoln Lancaster County. And here is the website for Lincoln Lancaster County. I'm gonna kind of look over to my other larger screen. I wanna point out is they've got some very good supplemental information. Uh, at the top of that webpage, uh, inside the circle portion, it says face covering requirements for Lincoln and Lancaster County. In the middle, it says business resources for business reopening guidance and recommendations. And the very bottom, it has a very quick link in terms of the testing process. Um, ties in with the Test Nebraska, but they have uh, information locally uh, coming from Bryan Health and CHI Health. So uh, if you're from uh, those locations, again, uh, very good to tap into it. All these links that I have here will get you to these pages. And Lincoln and Lancaster County, uh, they still have a directed health uh, measure. Um, whereas Douglas County does not, City of Omaha has the mask mandate. So it gets kind of confusing, I know. The thing that we need to remember is we've got to focus on what is the most stringent requirements. We've got to meet those most stringent. Um, one thing that's different with the Lincoln Lancaster compared to Nebraska is they define gatherings differently. They're more strict with it. Prohibited gatherings, Lincoln Lancaster County, are events with greater than 50 patrons, guests, or invitees. That green portion is not part of the state mandate. And prohibited gatherings in Lincoln Lancaster is going to remain at least until September 30th at 50% indoor, 75% outdoor. So even though Nebraska has relaxed things, you got to go with the most strict. Also, Lincoln Lancaster County says gatherings of less than people. So it could be just a few people, um, less than the 50% indoor, et cetera. If you don't maintain six foot physical distance, these are prohibited. So uh, much, much more restrictive than what we're seeing asked by Nebraska. So again, you have operations there, take note of that. And face on the face mask mandates, um, Governor Ricketts has come out and, and told all of us the state of Nebraska legally cannot issue a wide-scale mask mandate. Uh, they've got some portions where, for instance, if I'm going into a hair salon, uh, the regulations, the laws do allow them to regulate the salons and the both the customers and the um, workers there are do face a mask mandate from the state of Nebraska, but they can't do it statewide. Um, so. What happened, we, we all are aware probably Lincoln Lancaster County was first to the punch and then city of Omaha followed and their requirements are virtually identical, almost word for word. Uh, premises open to the general public, including in, uh, educational institutions requiring individuals to wear a face covering unless they can maintain at least six foot separation at all times from anyone who's not a household member. There are limited situations. I'm sitting at a table, consuming food, um, some people with medical conditions, et cetera, and you wanna certainly be aware of that. Um, and they're also strongly recommending to not become citizen police and go up and confront people that are not wearing a mask. Make the assumption that they're doing it for a valid reason and move on. Um, that's kind of a tough one, I know, uh, when I see occasional folks that, uh, really uh, you'd like to think to see in that situation they're wearing a mask. Um, back to the word guidance. The CDC is still the gold standard in the United States. Excellent, excellent, uh, uh, what I wanna say, it's almost encyclopedia of resource material. The one that we wanna focus on primarily, I think for those on the, uh, the meeting today, is uh, regarding community and organizations and businesses. And again, using this link that I've got here, you can come back and visit this. We can see that there's a lot of guidance for employers, how to prepare your business, uh, also how to deal with your employees coming back, uh, prevention, 
It also has guidance for specific industries like restaurants, casinos, manufacturing, meat and poultry processors, and uh, so forth. But uh, excellent resource. Um, but again, it's considered guidance. And where we have to really toe the line primarily is with the state requirements and again, our mask mandates that are somewhat local. And then Center for Disease Control, here's where I want all of you to kind of take note is there's changes, there's changes every day. And how do I keep abreast of that? There are recommendations. How do I know if a recommendation has come out that, that could impact me? I would strongly encourage all of you on this, uh, this webinar to go to this web page, and you'll again the easiest way is, is to come back to this presentation, and you can actually sign up. You can go to this web page I have depicted, depicted here, and that's where the link will take you to. But also on that web page, you can sign up to get email updates, and it'll tell you on a daily basis here is what recommendations have changed, and so you'll know right away if it's going to impact your operations or not. So I highly recommend being logged on to that. Um, some other tidbits that uh, are worth sharing, the Center for Disease Control now has a very extensive library. Uh, some of it's narrated in English, uh, same, same items are done in sign language and also narrated in Spanish. So a great number of videos, it's not just the ones you see on this page, but it's, it's a very large library and uh, could be useful for you and your operations. Uh, they continue to update their guidance on uh, face coverings. And if you look on the left-hand lower side, it talks about uh, gaiters and face shields. And it's warning us that evaluation is ongoing, but effectiveness is unknown at this time. And so um, as that, as that uh, any changes come about there, I, I think really for me, the gold standard is, is the, uh, the face covering that covers the nose and the mouth. And uh, if any doubt, when in doubt, then using some of those clear face shields in addition to that kind of face covering. Back to OSHA. So we visited them back in April and May. Uh, they continue to offer primarily tips and guidance, but they can cite using the general duty clause. And the general duty clause allows them where they don't have a specific regulation, they can look out to what is accepted practice in the industry, what is a recognized hazard, and are there measures out there, identified out there that can uh, mitigate, address the problem. And so the general duty clause could be used for not following the CDC or not following some of the many, many good recommendations that OSHA has. So if you have any questions at all, again, they and they have guidelines for manufacturing, warehousing, meat processing, retail, um, many, many types of uh, recommendations. And coming to the OSHA website, you can see this, this link here and it says OSHA.gov and it's actually a COVID website and the bulk of the material that you probably want to have a look at is on the right hand column. You can see I've kind of highlighted there. And they also have an excellent publication. It's a OSHA publication 3990 and I've actually taken the time to highlight a uh, version of that. We posted it to our web page at the National Safety Council, I'd highly recommend plucking that off. And uh, one thing that it points out that if you're uh, most non-healthcare employers will have personnel in the medium risk category because at some time or another, you're gonna have personnel passing in the hallways, working face to face with others and so forth. And so there is uh, categories of low, medium, high and extra high. Uh, the extra high comes in the healthcare for instance and, and also police and fire. And OSHA, like the CDC, has a web page that tracks all recent updates. So anytime new information comes out, um, you can see here that they have alerts and these alerts are all based, uh, when this screenshot was made was back in early August, but every day or every few days there have been updates. And so it's very good to uh, come back and visit that. You can't get a, a link or I'm sorry, you can't get a, a feed to you They give you an email every day. So it'd be something you'd probably want to come back to about once a week and, and visit out, visit this web page. And brings me to my final slide, uh, just to let the others know where I'm at and um, some good resources out there. The National Safety Council, the uh, um, national uh, headquarters, along with uh, a number of Fortune 500 companies have come out what they call a uh, 
their playbook, and it includes a number of checklists. Uh, it's an excellent tool. Um, to me, that's when we talk about gold standard and what the CDC is providing for recommendations, when it comes to businesses looking for checklists, looking for guidance for their business, this is an absolute must to go visit. Um, we also, and I'm gonna go ahead and just take you here to our own uh, templates and assessments webpage. Uh, light this up, have it uh, pop up here for a second. And down here at the bottom, this webinar we're on today, this is where I could pick this up at. Um, but off to the right, we have a number of resources. And one I'd like to really kind of point you to um, is a workplace assessment, the third one down for COVID. It's a, kind of a checklist um, type of format, very easy to follow. And I mentioned the business plan template. This is one adapted from the state of Minnesota. Uh, we've adapted it, uh, taken out some reference to the state. And uh, if you've got reasons to want to build a, uh, an actual business plan, um, these are two documents that I would highly recommend you come back and visit. And then lastly, uh, something that uh, Susan I know was a, a big part of, and that is there's a Be Safe Nebraska pledge. Um, it's in partnership with the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and also chambers from Omaha, Lincoln, and Kearney. And it's a pledge that you can go to. It ties back to that one of the checklists I just showed you at the Safe Nebraska site. And it ties back, and, it, and it's a way for you to publicly display uh, your commitment to, to making your workplace and your uh, uh, operations safe, not only for your employees, but for those that may visit your, your organization. So with that. Um, so Terry, and, <clears throat> thank you, that great um, information. Thanks for sharing all of that, and especially uh, helping us direct us right to the resources that we need to get to. I know when I'm looking for questions, I takes me a little while of Googling things to find the right answer. So I appreciate that you gave us those direct links. Um, Terry did mention that um, this um, entire presentation is available out at safenebraska.org slash COVID-19. So you can go out there and pull not only this presentation, but all of the other um, material that he has. Terry, I do have a question here. Um, I had the question that, are they still saying that if someone is in contact, that they don't have to self-quarantine, they just need to wear a mask until they get their test results back? Can you speak to that at all? Actually, that's, that's one where I've, I've kind of fallen behind uh, with all the, all the COVID chasing I've done. Um, I'm going to have to defer. While Jeff is doing his uh, presentation, let me go back and get the best answer for that. So um, let me tell you, um, just from personal experience, uh, currently the CDC is saying that if you have been in contact, it, part of it goes back to how direct your contact is. Um, I just personally came out of a 24-day uh, quarantine myself. The reason I was in quarantine for 24 days is that my daughter tested positive. Um, she lived in the household with us, so obviously I had very direct contact with her. CDC guidelines um, said that she needed to be quarantined after, uh, after testing positive, she needed to be quarantined for 10 days, and because I could possibly get it from her on the 10th day, then I had to be quarantined for 14. So I was actually uh, quarantined for 24 days. Not that yeah, I didn't I actually work from home, um, but I would say that you need to really take into account um, how close you are to that person and how, what your exposure really truly was. So I, I had the same aha moment when my wife uh, had symptoms and was tested and I tested at the same time that I was looking, I realized that I was looking at a 24 day period. It isn't 10, it isn't 14, it's both as being someone in close contact. And fortunately, um, she did not have a positive result, but uh, yeah, that's, that's something that uh, everyone needs to be prepared for. Right, so because uh, even though I tested negative, my daughter tested positive, and um, so, so I worked from home for 24 days and was uh, um, quarantined at home. So hopefully that helps you a little bit. I know that those are changing, and maybe during this time, Terry, if you wanna see if there's anything else that we can give to anyone uh, specific to that. Um, 
And then uh, I want to uh, echo what you said in reference to the Be Safe Nebraska Pledge. That really was designed uh, with the chambers as a way to provide confidence for not only the employees, but also for the employers and for all of their partners that you that companies, organizations are making a pledge to uh, truly do everything that they need to do to be safe. So uh, thank you again, Terry. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and flip um, the, uh, the reins over to Jeff. And as you do that, um, let me, if you can do that, Terry, that'd be great. I'm going to um, introduce Jeff. Jeff Niebaum is the Senior Communications Specialist for Better Business Bureau. He's been in his current role for almost 10 years. He has a, a master's degree and he's the Better Business Bureau's digital media guru. Uh, he also works on development, execution of all of BBB's community pro programs, such as their integrity awards, student programs, programs for seniors, cybersecurity, and fraud prevention programs. So uh, really excited about um, what Jeff is going to share with us today in reference to keeping your um, organization free from scams during COVID-19. I, uh, I get very frustrated with scammers. I don't understand how they can do what they do and feel good about their lives and go to sleep at the end of the day, but... Um, but that's just me. So Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you're very passionate about this subject. And so I'm excited to, to uh, hear what you have to share with us. Awesome. Well, thank you, Susan. And yes, great yes. job, Terry, on uh, explaining how we can be physically safe. Uh, it's, we're in such a trying time. And this new normal is definitely difficult to get used to. But uh, we're so glad that you could join us today for this presentation. Um, a big shout out to the National Safety Council for partnering with us uh, in this venture. Um, education is everyone's best defense, and the more you're informed, the better off you'll be. So we're going to kind of switch to a different mindset uh, of safety, and we're going to talk about cybersecurity and so that you and your employees um, can remain cyber safe. I'm just going to share my screen real quick so we can jump into the presentation. All right. Okay, so everybody hopefully should be seeing uh, my title slide here, Keeping Employees Physically Safe and uh, Free from Scams. And so today we're going to talk about scams surrounding the new normal as we re-enter our, our workplaces and our offices. It's, it's very important to know what to watch out for, because if you do, then you'll be able to spot it and you'll be able to um, remain scam free. So as we, uh, um, as consumers and as employees, we really have to pay attention to phishing scams. Phishing scams are the number one way scammers and hackers and cyber criminals try to trick us into get clicking on information. And if you look at uh, on my screen here in the top left, this is a basic phishing email that actually is a real example of something I received in my email uh, during this uh, COVID crisis. And you can kind of see, I'm, I'll talk to you a little bit about the red flags that you can watch out for. First and foremost, there's always a sense of urgency that scammers use right in the subject line. And if you look at the subject line, it says coronavirus masks are selling out. Take Action now before it's too late. Now you probably notice that there's a misspelling right here. And that's a second red flag is scammers, their grammar, their punctuation, their spelling is, is pretty bad. And I, I kind of joke around, uh, if they would just hire an English professor, they'd be a lot more effective. So but hopefully that doesn't happen because that is one of the biggest red flags that you can pay attention to that says, okay, that's going to be a scam. Again, big subject line. They talk about uh, masks that are selling out. And so they want you to click really quick without even thinking. And that's the biggest thing is you always have to think before you click. That will save you 99% of the time. And what are they trying to do? What's, what's their motive? They're just trying to get you to click 
on the click here button right here. This will take you to maybe a fake website. It will take you to a website that might be come up with an, uh, a message that is uh, broken uh, and you'll be a little, you might be a little confused on why they would do that. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to click on that link so they can put possibly malware on your computer or on your phones. Um, I know people think smart devices and uh, smartphones are, are really secure, but they're just as vulnerable as a desktop computer so, or a laptop. So you really have to pay attention to what you're clicking on, um, whether you're on uh, your, your computer or your, your phone. A big scam that is going around right now uh, is unclaimed package scams. And so, and this is more from the consumer side of things. So a lot, if you're like me, I do a lot of ordering off Amazon. And uh, if you're just, if you get a text message, you might be flooded with text that day. And you could say, oh, what is this? What is this all about? And like it says on the screen, we found a package from March pending for you. Kindly assume ownership and confirm for your delivery here. And again, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to click on that link so they can claim your information and use that against you. So if you get a, if you get a, a, a text like this, I would recommend just deleting it right away. If you do order a lot of things on Amazon, just go to your Amazon account and see if there is a notification on that as well. Social media scams right here in the bottom right. Social media scams have been rampant during the crisis because Scammers and hackers know that we are at home and we're on our computers a lot more. We're on social media a lot more, trying to fill that time. And so scammers are flooding social media with different types of scams. And this is just an example that I received on about a $100 gift card to Starbucks. Now, we all love our coffee and I am a big fan of Starbucks, but I've never seen Starbucks give away a $100 gift card. Maybe a free drink for your birthday, but not, um, not $100. And if you look at the, the URL down here in the bottom right, the URL is socialdistancing.coupons. So it doesn't even involve Starbucks. This, that's just the channel and the brand that they're trying to use to get you to trick you into falling for their scheme. So watch out for social media. And as adults, we, we kind of know the scams that are happening. But for social media, it's the young adults, it's, our, it's the children, it's grandchildren. So if you have uh, children and grandchildren that are very active on social media, which I'm sure you do, please tell them about these things and share this with them because we want them to really think before they just click on this. Because to, to a high schooler or a junior high, junior higher, a uh, $100 gift card to anywhere, um, seems pretty like an attractive offer. So th they're probably gonna click on that and that's where they can get in trouble. So please share this information with your loved ones. As we continue, we're gonna go switch over kind of to the business side of things. And the biggest way scammers and hackers target businesses is through business email compromise scams or we call it BEC. And business email compromise is the number one way and it usually is surrounded by phishing attacks, phishing emails, phishing text messages, anything like that. So you have to really pay attention when you're in the office or right now, like myself, I'm working from home. So you really have to pay attention to this because the workday is still going on and you still have your daily tasks and everything. But as you're working from home, that's just another level of areas where you might be a little distracted um, with everything going on at home. And so you really have to pay attention and look into the details of the emails that you are reading. So some of the examples about business email compromises are your CEO or your, your head manager to the CFO or an HR department. And in this kind of scan, in this kind of phishing email, they're going to say, they're going to try to direct that CFO or the person in charge of billing or anything like that to wire money to someone. And so if you get an email like this from your manager or um, the owner, really, really take a step back and say, okay, is this legit? And if there's a big sense of urgency, that's one of the biggest red flags right there is if this has to be done right now, you've got to watch yourself and you got to pay attention to that, that because that will be uh, a tell right there 
of, okay, there's something that seems a little off about this. Another example is a CEO request to employees. And I actually have a uh, example of one right here where uh, Robert, the owner said to Chris, are you available to run an errand for me? I need you to make, uh, make provision for gift card for me at any local store around. And this is actually hits very close to home because I actually know somebody who was a, uh, or who is a lawyer for a large toy company and we were, uh, who lives out in Seattle and we were out there visiting him and he actually got a, a, an email from his boss on a Sunday asking for the same exact thing. And he, his boss was requesting uh, that um, this, my friend go and buy $5,000 worth of gift cards to hand out to their employees just to give them a little extra perk during uh, a busy time for them. And so the crazy thing about it was my friend said that we were just having this conversation uh, with his boss about doing going above and beyond for their employees to make them feel a little bit more special. And so he's like, when I saw this, this just kind of fit right into that conversation. And the only thing that saved him was he, and he was checking his email on his phone, which as we all know, is, is kind of difficult because the lettering's small and um, scammers are very good at just changing one little letter, one little number to make an email seem legit, but to the naked eye, we just kind of skim over it. So you really have to pay attention, especially if you're checking your email on your phone. But the tell was that he saw one letter was missing from the email or was changed to like a one, like an L was changed to a one. And if he would have saw that, he would have gone out and spent $5,000 right there on a Sunday. And so you really have to pay attention because scammers are out there. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And the biggest um, misconception that we see with businesses is that if you're a small business, they think that, well, scammers aren't going to come after us. We're, we don't have a big enough payroll. We, we don't have enough money for them. And that's exactly the opposite because scammers are targeting small businesses because they usually don't have the securities in place in the, in the walls to keep scammers out. And so they're a lot easier to hack into and trick employees. So if you're a small business, you really have to be sharp, especially during this time, because I'm sure you have received one or two emails a week on asking for weird requests and scammers trying to get in and attempt, attempting to fish you. So really, really pay attention to that detail. Another example of BEC scams is a vendor invoice. I don't know how many times I received an email like this. I would say at least a dozen where they're just, uh, you get a, a fake request from a vendor saying, hey, we still haven't been paid for this order. Uh, please click on the attachment or link the below to access it and pay online. Again, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to open that link or click on that link or open that attachment to put malware in your computer and collect your information. So you really have to pay attention to that because if you're the person in the office that takes care of the invoices and things like that, you, it, it falls on your, on your shoulders and you can say, oh, okay, well, this is just an, um, another thing I have to do right now and you might be backed up or whatnot. So if you, if you receive something like this, please take a step back, take a deep breath, before you click on anything. And um, again, another example is executives uh, requesting employee information from HR. So if you're an HR director, and you, you know you deal with people's uh, tax information like W-2s and everything like that. And so if you get a, a, an email requesting, hey, can you just send me over so-and-so's uh, tax information? I just, I wanna take a look at it, make sure it's correct um, for us moving forward. Again, take a step back and see if that's a normal request. Because if it's not, then you might be in a, a phishing attempt. So really, really pay attention to, again to detail. And uh, the last one, last example is senior employees requesting direct deposit. So if you're like me, we get our, our checks directly deposited and most workplaces do these days. And so if, you, if you're a, a, an employee or a senior employee that's taking care of this kind of information and you get an email like this, 
one, there's going to be a sense of urgency and say, hey, can you direct deposit this before, or can you change my bank account before our next check is direct deposited? Here it is. And, the, and again, there will be that sense of urgency that, oh, okay, I got to do this real quick. I got it from a senior employee like my manager. I want to, I don't want to mess this up. I want to impress them. But it's okay if you take your time and, and, and take a step back because the best thing that you can do to avoid business email compromise scams is double verification. You have to set up a, a verification process with your management or with your, uh, your owners and to say, okay, if I receive an a request like this, I need to come and double verify with you to make sure it's legit. Whether it's a um, payment for a little bit of amount of money or thousands of thousands of dollars, have that policy and procedure set up so you know what to do if you receive a request like that. And uh, we had a speaker from the National Fraud Association here uh, do a program for us. And he went to a, um, a seminar down in Florida and where he was speaking. And it was for a group that they, um, they sponsor every year. And he got a request for, or he got a phone call from his executive assistant saying, Hey, I got uh, an email saying that we haven't paid our dues um, for this year uh, for this organization. I know you're down there right now. I just want to call and see if uh, this was legit or not. And he's like, no, I took care of that um, at the beginning of the year. So this is obviously a, a phishing attempt and to try to get them to wire money to uh, a scammer. And so if they didn't have that double verification process set, in place, they could have lost uh, thousands of dollars right there. So it's really, really important to double verify before you send anything out. And if you are contacted anywhere in the email or the text message that says something about gift cards or wiring money, those are two big red flags right there. So again, take a step back if you see something like that and say, okay, is this legit? And if you do go through with it, don't worry. You got to tell somebody though, because the biggest mistake you can do is keeping it uh, and not telling anybody because then scammers might be in inside your computer system. And uh, if you're in a big office, they can access everything. And so you have to tell somebody about it. And as a manager, you want your employees to tell people about, or tell you about something that bad happens. So you really don't want to come down on them hard and say, why did you do this? You just screwed up everything because that is going to stop employees from coming to you and say, okay, I made this mistake. How do we fix this? So you, again, you want employees to be telling you if something is going wrong. Sorry, I just had to admit another person. Uh, and finally, hijacking scams. Uh, if it's a legit organization, um, I mean, here's an example of the BEV's brand being hijacked and sent out to people. And if you can kind of see in the subject line, it says BEV exclusive antiviral hand sanitizer now available to our members. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have our accredited businesses who are our members. And so if you receive this, I mean, this might seem a little bit or kind of legit, but again, if you're a legitimate brand, you are probably being hijacked by scammers. I know the FBI has, um, local police, um, Netflix. I mean, anything. If you are a big brand, you have been hijacked at some point. And so, again, it's just about doing your due diligence, making sure nobody's hacking, like, on your Facebook's account or Google. It's a great thing to Google yourselves um, and your company to see what is out there. And if scammers have created fake sites or fake social media channels, to trick people into thinking that they're dealing with a legitimate organization when they're not. So really to avoid hijacking scams, really do your due diligence, do your research about your company, make sure nobody's saying anything or creating anything that's false or misleading um, because scammers are very good at what they do. And like Susan pointed out at the beginning, if, if scammers would just put some of that, that they're, their knowledge to good, the world would be definitely a better place. But since scamming people is a hundred, hundreds and hundreds of million dollar 
uh, industry, they're going to keep going. So scams are not going to stop. We have to continue to keep educating ourselves so we don't fall for a scam. Okay. So a couple of ways that BBB helps um, consumers and businesses is our website, BBB.org. You can go and research any company out there to see if they're legitimate or not, especially with um, the coronavirus crisis going on. People are using a lot of companies online and doing a lot of online shopping. So you really have to pay attention. Take five minutes, jump over to BB.org, search for the company, see what's being said about them, look at customer reviews, look to see if there's an alert about this company. Or, And we have profiles on thousands and thousands of businesses. So again, take five minutes and just jump over here. I always say five minutes of research can save you a lot of time, money, and a big headache. So research, research, research. Uh, again, I, I kind of mentioned customer reviews. Uh, if you have a, a bad experience about a business where you got ripped off um, because they were not legitimate or anything like that, write a customer review. Let people know your experience. But it doesn't always have to be negative. If you have a positive experience, please, please, please uh, write a customer review for that company because especially right now when times are tough for businesses, they're looking for a little extra energy and a, a positive customer review can definitely do that. So I highly recommend uh, customer reviews. Uh, BV Scam Tracker is a, an incredible tool that we offer um, to the public for free where you can report and you can also view scams that are happening in your state, in your city. Um, and so it's just a great tool to access to educate yourself and to educate others and say, okay, I got contacted through a package um, text that said I had an uh, unclaimed package and you can take a screenshot, you can upload it so people can see what is going on. And you can access Scam Tracker by going to bb.org slash Scam Tracker. And so it's just a great tool to check out uh, on the weekly to see, okay, what type of scams are happening in our area? Because if you know about it, then you're gonna be able to stop it from, from yourself falling victim. So please tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your loved ones to check out BB Scam Tracker because it's just a great tool to educate yourself so you don't fall scam or fall victim to a scam and lose your hard earned money. So some of the sources that we've created here at the Better Business Bureau surrounding uh, these trying times uh, in the, uh, the crisis and uh, the virus is we, we uh, have our, our news outlet where we upload um, documents and stories uh, about different types of scams and uh, business information and tips on how to really work through and become a better consumer and a better business during these trying times. And you can access that at bbb.org slash coronavirus. We also have created a site just for businesses. Uh, and you can access that at bbb.org slash coronavirus dash business. Um, and this provides great information on how you can excel during this time as a business, because there's a huge difference, uh, as you can see, as some businesses are closing down and shutting their doors for good, while others are thriving during this time. And so we give you some great tips to make sure that your business and your employees are thriving, and so you don't have to shut your doors. We also have created a um, resource pages uh, for different states that we're in. Uh, up here on the example on the screen is for Nebraska. And this is just a great um, resource page that you can, okay, what, if I had a question about small business uh, administration, you can go there, uh, the chamber, uh, Department of Health, Attorney General. So great organizations that you can access right there on one page. So please check that out on our website at bv.org. Great way to stay up to date is uh, our, you can follow us on our social media channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just search today with BEB. If you're on LinkedIn, you can search Better Business Bureau Inc. Um, but social media is, uh, we, I, I am in charge of our social media and I update it every single day with different types of scams going around, different programs that we're offering. And it's just the best way to stay up to date. Well, that's all I have. So I'm going to turn it back over to Susan to see if there's any questions. Thank you, everyone. Awesome, thank you, Jeff, I appreciate it. Um, I don't show any other questions coming in, Jeff, so that's great. 
Um, but thank you for sharing and reminding all of us um, about <laughs> what we need to know when it comes to some of those scams. I know that I personally get those emails every day. Um, I get them from our CEO telling me that I need to run to Walmart and buy uh, gift cards. Um, I personally know someone who fell for that. Uh, it was very tough on the organization that she worked for. And, and like you said, it just kind of uh, um, happened at one of those times when uh, it had been being discussed that maybe we should give gift cards to our customers. So uh, unfortunately it happens. And uh, um, so we need to be aware, very aware of those. So again, thank you to Jeff and thank you to Terry. We appreciate everybody's input on everything that you shared with us today. Um, I gave you a couple of links and, and Terry talked about those. Please go out and take the pledge to um, make sure that you're doing all of the things that you need to do to, for a safer Nebraska. Again, that's at safenebraska.com that you can find those. And uh, for those HR folks, I hope that you'll register at uh, safenebraska.org to, um, to be involved in any of our certificate programs, especially the one that's safety for HR resource professionals. That's a great one. Give you a lot of information about uh, OSHA requirements, et cetera. And then use the resources that Jeff shared as well. So thank you again to everyone. As I mentioned, this was being recorded. So you can access the recording on the Better Business Bureau's website or the Safety Council's website. And we look forward to seeing you all back here again. I'm sure we'll be partnering with uh, BBB again on another um, uh, session coming up, webinar coming up, and we'll let you all know about that. Thank you again, everyone. Wear your seatbelts when you're out there and have a safe day.